Hello and welcome to the National Book Festival. My name is Sasha Dowdy from the Library of Congress. I'm here with John Cheska and Steven Weinberg, whose featured book at the festival this year is Astronauts Mission 2, The Water Planet. If you'd like to see their presentation at the festival, log on to nationalbookfestival.com and you'll find the pre-recorded presentation on the children's stage. Welcome, John and Steven. Uh-oh, they're not here yet. We're weightless Whoa. in space. Can you turn on the gravity machine, John? I will turn on the gravity machine. You're gonna keep on floating up higher and higher if you don't turn it. Oh. Oh. We're back. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Safe arrival. Okay. Welcome, John and Steven. Well, thanks, Sasha. Yeah, thank you for the introduction. We're here in the uh, Thomas uh, Jefferson nose rocket, so some, you can see space behind us. Somewhere in the Orion Nebula, yeah. we believe. I mean, first one's here. Yeah. No one else. No one else is here. Yeah. But well, we're thank ready you so much for everything. beaming in from outer space to be with us at the National Book Festival today. So we we already have questions rolling in for you all. Here's one from Sarah. John, where is your ambassador for young people's literature medal today? Oh, Good question. I think I left it back in my pod. Yeah, it's in the nose rocket. But or I or it might be the shiniest <laughs> star. Well, remember we used it to hit. The... <laughs> oh, it is. It's the shiniest star. I was going to say we battled that giant lizard with it and bonked him. He may have it. That was good. That's why you always want to hang out with the national ambassador of yeah. children's literature. <laughs> yes, because you well, never you know when you're going to need that award. The acronym is like yeah, yeah, yeah. It's good to have that award. Good, good opening question, Sarah. Yeah, buttering Ooh. him up. Yeah. So I might, I have it on. <laughs> the two of you seem to really get along well, but when you're in space, how do you find space from each other? Wow. wow. That is a great question. Yeah, I'm always like, John, I'm not for a spacewalk. Yep. And don't always have like a rocket booster to fix. Or I often quote my granddaughter who told me yesterday, um, Sometimes I have need some alone time. She, I mean, just, would say she that. just whipped that sentence out of nowhere. It's like great. Yeah. It, yeah, it's hard to find in a nose rocket, but it's a pretty big nose rocket. Yeah, actually, no, we show yeah. all the details in book one. Um, and a lot, and it's even in a book lot of, two, we follow up. There's, it's a big diagram. I don't know so. if this, this will translate on our. The, the resolution might be a little choppy because we're so far out in space. Yeah, like 430 uh, light years. Yeah, but oh, there's oh, like right. a pool here. There's a common room. The auditorium. Astrotorium. Astrotorium. Yep. Yeah. So that's a good place. Yeah. For space. For space. All right. Well, it sounds like you have a pretty good time overall. Uh, so we have another question from Earth. Uh, Cynthia says, which books excited each of you when you were kids? Ooh, so many. Yeah. Um, I've been reading a lot with my kids, Alexander and the tar Terrible, Horrible? No Good, no good Terrible, very... Horrible, Very Bad Day. I think. Yeah, I Which love that, that oh, one. That's a I'm a middle one. kid, so that's like my life. I was just getting... <laughs> gum in your hair and getting caught when you were punching your brother, but they punched you first, but you're in yeah. trouble. And I think mine was probably Go Dog Go, which was a lot like my family of five brothers. And we were all driving around in different colored cars, barking like dogs, and then we would have a party and a treat. You guys do have good treat parties. Every day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you had fun as kids, we can tell. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. This is their job, basically. And then we got sent into space. Yeah. Somewhere. Here's a question from uh, Lisa for John. Uh, reading out loud your stories from Knucklehead was greatly enjoyed by myself and my students. Do you think you'll write a second book of stories from your childhood with your brothers? Ooh. That's funny you should say that. I've been thinking maybe, but I also thought, I don't know, that would be weird. But I do Did have you a work with your brothers on that. <laughs> no. <laughs> I worked, I write all this stuff because I even have a couple of brothers who said, How come like all the stories were weird about me? That was Greg. Um, I said, Oh, sorry, Greg, because you were weird. <laughs> you wouldn't want to give your brothers like that could be a funny book if they got oh, to write don't their let own the brothers story. Tell the I don't stories. think you should do that. That's yeah. half a reason to be a writer. Yeah. You get to tell the story. I mean, not that I invented anything, but 
because I look good in all those stories. <laughs> I might think about more Knucklehead because I do have more. Well, we really want to know more, I'm sure, everyone in the audience. So you have a lot of time and space. Please get to that. Good point. Yeah, I could be doing and that yeah, in my job. We hang time. out by the old like astro fire pit at <laughs> yeah, night, and exactly. John tells me the same stories. <laughs> well, I've only got three. I, got, I need some. More. <laughs> Although we should probably tell you how Stephen and I work together. That's actually I, a question from Beth. How, what's your collaboration process like? How do you share, develop ideas together? How do you decide what's in words and pictures? Oh wow. Uh, well, we the whole process is, I guess, rather unusual. Yeah. From the get go as most books are not i can't even explain this yeah I like the writer that. the writer doesn't ever see the illustrator but i have to see more him. often yeah like they'll just you get a manuscript steven will get it then he'll have to just go like oh well, i'll just draw it yeah but i have to see john all the time because he's my father-in-law <laughs> <laughs> and i live across the street from steven we're up here in the catskills yeah. when we're not in the nose rocket yeah out in space um, and we did all our work mostly in Steven's studio. Some we did when I was in New York City, like on a computer hangout. Yeah, we actually were doing this well before it was cool. Yeah, that's true. Um, but yeah, and then we work on everything. We do an outline first. And once we have that nailed down with our editor, we basically do every single spread in the book, like spread by yeah, like the two pages. And I'll do a sketch of that. And John's like over my shoulder. Saying what should happen. Right, so Steven, jokes, don't do that. Cracking a whip. <laughs> but it is kind of that great opportunity to say, like, here's what we want to happen in this chapter. How do we show that? And then Stephen and I try to get as many jokes in as we can. Yeah. And we just change things around until, or we, it might be just time for a dramatic shot like that, which doesn't take a whole lot of writing. It's just more Stephen going, like, look at this. I can just do this entire. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, and then the other ones like this, like where we introduce the characters, that's pretty fun because there's just room for so many little things to happen yeah. in there. And so by the time the book where I'm doing the final art, my studio, it looks pretty wild where it's yeah. every single spread of the book is up on the wall. Oh, that was in that's in the video. Yeah, that's, that's online too, because you can see all the black and white drawings behind us. And then we can kind of see the entire book just laid out in Steven's studio. Yeah. That's cool. awesome. So when you write a book full of jokes and explosions, um, Shelly wants to know, what are you hoping kids will learn from this series? Like oh. first, how to tell a joke. Definitely Next, how to make a Be explosion. careful with methane. Be careful with methane. Yeah. Uh, don't light it don't unless light you're it. on a camping trip with a bunch of your friends. Uh, yeah, I'm, that's John's <laughs> advice. Uh, no, that was, I'm not gonna say I don't just, do that. I just said the NASA had that advice. Yeah, I mean, we're trying to like do, really talk about the climate crisis that we're all in the middle of. Yeah. And it's a pretty heavy topic. So yep. we try to have a lot of science and a lot of jokes. So people want to read about it. Yeah. And that was really the idea when Stephen and I first started. Um, Cause I had a bunch of books out. Stephen was just getting some books out and we were sh like doing presentations to kids. And we thought that'd be fun to work together. Like what yeah. should, what should we do? And we thought climate change is a huge topic that's affecting everyone and so how do you do that but in a funny way because we were looking at books like the 13 story treehouse yeah. and dog man and Wimpy Wimpy Kid. love that format yep. and we're like could we kind of marry these ideas together yeah and, and then even go the next step actually that's a fun thing uh, steven you should tell like where this artwork came from it's yeah that was another mm. addition to this whole process where around this time a couple of museums like the 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 Royal Dutch Museum being the one that we use a lot in this book, they decided to open up their whole collection. So people could, anyone, not just me, can take art from them and reuse it in any way yeah. they really want to. So Look I could use like a Hokusai thing. wave as a wave on the water planet. Um, That's Mount Fuji in the background. <laughs> I thought that was a great way to <laughs> so start, beautiful. Yeah, start showing stuff as we were talking about climate change where you want to use every resource available. Yeah. So why not use like every bit of art ever made? And I always love that teaching moment where you just you just embed those things in the storytelling. Like you don't make it a lecture. It's where the astronauts go. They're looking for things that truly would make a Goldilocks planet yes. if we had to go somewhere else. But they also happen to be doing battle with a giant Venus flytrap. Or in book two on the water planet, clams are in charge 
So they have to <laughs> battle the clams. Yeah, fight those clams. Including Clam McConnell. Clam McConnell is a slippery clam. He is. Yeah. Clam Rockefeller. P.T. Clam. P.T. Clam Barnum. Yeah. <laughs> it could clam. happen. Dangerous it, could, it could happen. That's the warning on this book. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. What was the question again? Yeah. <laughs> I think you answered it, but uh, you... <laughs> You are such a great teacher. You share this message of uh, a dire thing happening to Earth right now. And yeah. John, this is not your first time being a role model for kids. You were, you know, national ambassador for young people's literature, which we brought up before. But Marie wants to know what's your fondest memories from your role as the first ever national ambassador for young people's literature. And maybe Stephen, you have a favorite Maybe memory of John being, being the national ambassador. I think that's a good question too. Well, John, I think you the, should really start. There. The most fun was like I was out on tour um right after it kind of happened and I got the medal. So I was out on tour with Dave Shannon and we would go to schools and just I would show kids the medal. And Dave just decided he would become the vice ambassador. So we just called him vice and he was like my second in command, my Dick Cheney kind of at the moment because wow. it was that era. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> I don't know if I'd go with Dick Cheney for anybody. <laughs> but I Who wants to be that guy? But Dave was so good because he would just make stuff up at every class we would go to. And we were doing truck town for younger kids. So we were at a group of like 200 kindergartners. And Dave said, well, the traditional way you greet an ambassador and say goodbye is you salam. So he got like 150 kids going like, oh, Oh, uh, as I came in and as I left, and I just abused that for the next. I mean, we four years, still kind of do it. I do. I still do it. I yeah. make people salam as I come and go. My wife doesn't do it anymore. She's kind of bummed. Now your grandkids are starting to do it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's good. Yeah. The next next generation salaming the ambassador because it's a it's a, a position for real? life. I don't know if you know that. I'm Stephen. sure Jason agrees with you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and Kate DiCamillo and Jean Yang. Yeah, it's it's for life. You will be remembered always. The Library of Congress never forgets. Oh, wow. <laughs> that's kind of like the slogan of the Library of Congress. Right? I think so. Yeah. We have the things in your pocket. <laughs> we catalog. So we have two questions that are kind of related to each other from Mamie. She wants to know how long have you known each other? And Ellen wants to know, John, you worked with many authors. Who's your favorite to work with besides Stephen, of course? Stephen. Mm. Oh, well, besides, you said besides Stephen. Oh. Let's see, when... I would have probably 10 years ago. Yeah, because you were still in college. Yeah. So for, I guess, a long time. Yeah. And what was the other question? Who's your favorite <laughs> Who's besides me to work There with? is nobody besides Steven. Um, you know what? Kind of every illustrator I think I've ever worked with. Lane you work Smith. With some really great people. Yeah. yeah and it's good so books. good to like hand over some words and then see how it becomes something even better. Which is what Steve and I love to tell kids about, like, find someone to collaborate with. Like, yeah. I mean, maybe you don't love drawing so much or maybe you both do and you can both draw. Yeah, it's really fun to work together. It's just you kind of, I don't know, uh, the parts that seem hard for me sometimes, like the writing part. And John, yeah. you think like the drawing part is yeah, not okay. super easy. And then you have days where like, I'm just drawing whatever I want. And you're telling me what jokes to put in and just kind of, yeah, it's a lot easier. And our stuff is always better after Steve and I work on it together. And we just decide, like, think like, oh, that's funny. But we always think of something else. Like, yeah. Here's something even funnier. You like two monsters. Let's have 12 monsters. That's a very fun feature of book two. So we, uh, I think we have like 20 yeah. some sea monsters oh. individually with their powers and their names. And oh, that was one yeah. of these Look at these that... guys. Because we thought, this is a good yeah. idea. What if they fought yeah. monsters? you got to have sea monsters. Because you're in the ocean with yeah. a water planet. And then, what if there were just more? We really wanted page after page of this. <laughs> yeah. And uh, this was the compromise. There's still a lot of sea monsters. There's still a lot of sea monsters. Yes. Yeah. It really is a lot. You must have uh, done a lot of research. So that's what Rachel's question is about. I was curious about what type of research you did for the astronauts. There's some sneaky science bits mixed in there with the vegetarian shark chefs. Oh, that's a good touch oh, too. Yeah. That's a lot of both of us. Like we, and sometimes it takes us places. We knew we would have to research the hard science of what is it? What kind of planet would be habitable? Yeah, for humans, and like that was that stuff on stuff. even like from NASA directly. They've yep. done a lot of research yep. with that. 
I love this. The third book we're working on is called The Perfect Planet. No yeah, one gives too much preview, away. Though. Good idea. But it's Earth. <laughs> yeah, when you think about it. Yeah. Uh, but before fires invented. So it's a lot of yeah. early human stuff. And that we read a lot of books about early humanity. Yeah. It's pretty wild how. And what you shape think about how long we've been then? a species on the planet. Yeah. And how long we've been kind of acting like we do now. Oh, and that's why it's so good to have Earth as the narrator. Because um, she's obviously not too thrilled about what's going on. Because it's just like. She's been around for four billion years. Yeah, that and time humans, scale. Where we've been a really yeah, annoying blip, a blip on her. We're just a blip. So she gets to always narrate the books and just say like, yeah, guys, please find a planet or do something good, right? And then Stephen also knows a bunch of people who are, are doing the real science of like oceanographic stuff. Yeah, especially for this book. Know. One of my best yeah. friends from college is an oceanographer. Um, so I would just ask him questions all the time. Yeah, because some of it too is we want to help offer like a helpful alternative. We don't want to just say like, don't be bad, but here's actually a thing you could do to help. Yeah, out. it's also pretty fun to ask a real scientist or like, what would it be like if a planet was just water? <laughs> yeah, And they start giving you a real answer and then you're like, and if it was run by clams? And they're like, <laughs> oh, okay, that's not a real science question. <laughs> that's where it goes off the rails. But I'm glad Stephen's asking asking the questions. The hard questions. <laughs> yeah, those are the real questions, the real answers. Yeah. Um, so we're going to zoom in from Earth as narrator onto uh, our wolf. So Joanne wants to know, has a wolf given you any more true stories? I just, yeah, I just put that together like a week ago. That this is John's second book starring a wolf. There's Alpha Wolf in this book, in all our Astro books. And a wolf himself, yeah, you know, but he's still in the slammer. He has not gotten out. But he's, I've been talking to him regularly. He's got some appeals coming up, maybe. Hmm. And it's been like 30 years almost. Since we can I do wrote a, his first story, a bridge, like novella of a wolf <laughs> making a deal with and NASA no. to get out of the slammer if they could like mutant him up Ooh, and yeah. then send him into space. Maybe they could. I don't know. I'm not too many ideas, John. But <laughs> so many ideas. This is what we do. All the also, time. <laughs> the good part to have two people, you can sometimes just say like, no, nah, it's, that's, that's, that's too much. Weird. That's too much. Yeah. yeah, that's how you eliminate the things that maybe don't need to make it into the next book. Yeah, I got a question the other day. Someone asked, like, like, what would be your favorite planet? What would be on a planet? Yeah. And we said, I don't know. How about yours? You tell us. And that the pizza planet came up. Yeah, that's a real, that's like the one planet. we haven't gotten to explore. What would the pizza planet be like? Very cheesy. Crust. Crusty, crust. also crusty. Yeah. A lot of plate tectonics, right? Like crust, Pepperoni. Would there cheddar? be different continents of toppings? Mm -hmm. The mushroom continent, I'm guessing. Yeah. Would Just it be hot pizza or cold pizza? I guess the well, polar regions would be cold. <laughs> freezing cold. Yeah. Icy pizza. Ooh, weird. Yeah. These are the no, we do. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> this is what we do. Now draw that. <laughs> you got what it. would that look like? <laughs> So it sounds like you could continue writing the astronaut series forever, but Chris wants to know, what are you going to work on after you're done with the astronaut series? Wow. Mm. We've yeah. been thinking of a bunch of goofy ideas already uh, because Stephen has two daughters, one who's three years old and one one year old. Yeah. And there uh, are, are they're really like too. always inspiring ideas. Yeah. And yeah, I don't know. I, we love watching them play. The idea of a kid yeah. holding toys, and playing, and playing with them and just yeah. their own stories going from there. And it also really focuses your storytelling too. You realize like, I mean, that's what I, I was a teacher for 10 years. And I think that's what really informs all my stuff. I always think of just trying to reach a class of kids and you don't have time to just kind of babble around and don't like get caught down sidelines, but tell the story. Yeah, what's like the immediate thing? Yeah, yeah. I'm doing a board book series that's all about home appliances. Oh. Because I just this saw my great. daughter loved a dishwasher. She yeah. loved washer and dryer. She loved fridge and oven. So, so each each appliance gets its own book. With googly eyes. I'm so jealous. I wish I had a book with googly eyes. That sounds awesome. That sounds like a book for everyone, not just little kids. <laughs> yeah, wouldn't you just love to have that book right now? Yes. Yeah, 100%. Here. I don't know. Everything's slower yeah. now. So here's a question from Anne Marie, uh, speaking of your young children. Besides your own books, what contemporary children's authors do your children and grandchildren enjoy? 
Ooh. Um, what is she reading a lot of right now? She loves the new Adam Rex book, Unstoppable. Oh, yeah. That yeah. one is it's just very funny. It's kind of a great little civics lesson, too, unexpectedly. And just the other day, I got a brand new Lori Keller book about Arnie the Donut. Oh, which yeah, I that's think a was great energy. Ones. She's got a whole nother Arnie the Donut book, and it's just as funny as all the other ones. And again, what a compelling thing, right? Like a story about donuts. Yeah. And um, all the donuts. Yeah, and then my older daughter, Amina, she's three, and she I read uh, the Hilda books, those graphic yeah, novels. Yeah. And there's a new one from France called Aster, which is similar to Hilda. Yeah. Uh, and Zeta the Space Girl, that whole genre of like really tough girl in kind of fantasy, yeah, whatever. Yeah. I love those. And I love that she's a fan of the older books too, like the Frog and Toad, all of those she has just Oh, memorized. George and Martha, yeah. George and she's Martha, a, she has down. Yeah. yeah. That's a great mix of contemporary and classics. Yeah, yeah. And then Jan Jessica books all the time. Yes, she's always coming home with a new one. <laughs> my wife honestly <laughs> finally she put away the truck town books because amina would ask for like is this john Cheska's truck town and yes yes john Cheska's truck town. she does have a lot of books like uh, it's a pretty great place for these two girls where yeah I mean, good point. the amount of books in our two houses combined is yeah yeah it's a lot it's not as many as the books. library of congress has that's true because felix lately is liking a little tiny she's one year old so she toddles around and it's any book she can grab and kind of rip apart. Yeah, there's a little tarogomi, uh, like little truck, little plane, little boat. She also likes the map of Paris, which is about this big <laughs> and indestructible. And she keeps trying, I will rip this. <laughs> What's their new favorite? Why not? I will chew this. You gotta know. You gotta yeah. know. All the streets. That's amazing. A uh, very tenacious young person, sounds like. So uh, <laughs> speaking of the John Cheska books, uh, Erica wants to know, why did you write The Stinky Cheese Man and other fairy, fairly stupid <laughs> tales? Why? <laughs> why? I mean, is that like an accusing why? Or is that it a could be. Why did you have to do it, John? <laughs> yeah, stop it. Well, interesting enough, because Stephen's wife, my daughter, Casey, one of her favorite stories was The Gingerbread Man. And we had an old copy of The Gingerbread Man, and she would make me read it a million times. And I was just like, and I love fairy tales since I was a kid too, and read them all the time, but I was going nuts. I couldn't stand the story anymore. I tried to get rid of the book, but she would always find it. So I thought, I gotta write a new version of this. Like what would happen if the lady ran out of gingerbread? It was like that tiny idea mm -hmm. that then became a much more gigantic thing. Cause you change only one thing in that story. You're only changing what the gingerbread man is made out of. It's different once it hits the water though. Yeah, exactly. I mean, things change from there. It's so, changed yeah. a lot. <laughs> and then I, then it just became the stinky cheese man and all his friends. Yeah. It's a good origin story. So we're <laughs> talking about kids and grandkids as inspiration. Um, and Beth wants to know, do your children or grandchildren also write and or illustrate? Do you think there will be a dynasty? A dynasty. <laughs> oh, wow. That's, that's a good question. Too. Um, they are. Yeah. I mean, like yeah. they're drawing a lot. It's pretty fun. Like just like we have all these books, I have yeah. all these art supplies. I've always wanted them to yeah. be just kind of ubiquitous. So yep. it doesn't seem like a big production. Uh, no, I think they'll just do it as part of their life because that is the thing. Like they see Stephen and I writing all the time. Stephen's just drawing all the time and the stuff is around. Yeah. And Stephen and I will often just, oh, you make little books all the time. Yeah, that's like uh, with a, whenever I have an idea, I love just kind of making, we call them dummies. Yeah. Just like a little version of a, the book. And that's what half the books that Amina and Felix read, not half, but yeah. a lot of them are books that I've made like on over the last two days. And just I'm taped to see together, if they stapled together. So they, they know books from like the seed to the tree. Yeah. So yeah. Well, we were actually worried. They were thinking like, uh, I mean, this is what books are. They're all done by either like their dad or their grandfather. <laughs> that must be what happens. And, uh, and my wife, your daughter, Casey's written. Oh, she and she's got a bunch too. Book. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of writers. We look Dynast forward to this dynasty developing then. It's going to be great. <laughs> so we've reached advice. <laughs> we've reached advice corner. Um, Lisa would like to know what are must have books when traveling in space? Wow. Ooh. Well, the first books. one is like um, the Trekker's Guide to Space. Oh, that would be a good one. Because it tells you like hot spots to go to, good little hitchhiker's guides. Hitchhiker's Guide is another good one. 
Hmm. It's a lot like that. They're like combined together. There's space. I mean, we're here. What did we we're forget? Here. What books did we mean? Well, to get? we left our, our dictionary. Dictionary, good. We forget about words. Yeah. We're just making up spelling at this point. I have been looking up a lot more of the, um, you know, like the the thing they the Viking ship, whatever they sent out in the space. Oh, yeah. Not a Viking, it's the Viking explorer. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. Uh, and how they try to like whittle down Earth's culture into a couple gold records. Yeah. It's very hard. Voyager. Voyager, yeah. Yeah. And that was Carl Sagan trying to decide, like, and there's Chuck Berry on there. There's uh -huh. a little... <laughs> and whale sounds. I've got the record. There are whale sounds. Yeah. We might have it somewhere in our nose rock. <laughs> I like reading about books where in, like, the future you would have, like, if you're in space, you have, like, your reading device, and it's just every book ever made. Which wow. it seems like science fiction of 20 years ago, but kind of what we expect now. We also found it doesn't work so good because Wi-Fi is not great everywhere in the universe. Yeah. So we do have a <laughs> lot of copies of Go Dog Go and Alexander and the No just, Good, Very Terrible, <clears throat> Very Bad Day. Yeah, probably just all three astronauts. That would be important. <laughs> all three astronauts. Every astronaut. Only our explorer. books. Yeah, <laughs> that would be bad. We keep making every species read these over and over. Uh, fun fact, there's actually another book within Astronauts Mission 2. Uh, most of Moby Dick is in this book. Yeah. It's in the agreement between the clams and the astronauts. Because P.T. Clam Barnum kind of fakes them out and he says, oh, look, there's an agreement. We can swap planets. So All you have to do is sign it. I'm so bad at this. Getting so we realized we needed a lot of text. And what Stephen put in there in the fine print is the text to Moby Dick. There's no longer a copyright on Moby Dick. No. Uh, so it starts, call me Ishmael. Yeah. And then the finer print is some later chapters. It gets really hard to the read. But that would be a good book to have in space with yeah. lots of books inside of it. Good call. It would be. Or more astronauts would be good because the other feature we haven't shown you is in every astronaut's book. Ooh. We, I mean, they usually end up battling. And in every book, there is a fold-out battle scene. Four pages. This is where John does all the big heavy lifting. <laughs> yeah, not so much writing, a lot of directing. He's got three words in this one. <laughs> like Steven, put that thing over there. <laughs> well, thank you for that unbiased recommendation. That's yeah, nobody right. came off the top yeah, of our just telling it like We're it just is. looking in our library. Yeah. What do we have? <laughs> <laughs> We have one more um, advice corner question. This one is a little bit more serious from Kathleen. What can kids do about climate change? Ah, that is a great question. Yeah, really good question. Yeah. Uh, well, number one, tell every adult they need to register to vote. Yep. And they need to vote. Um, and further the science. I mean, yeah. I think that's probably the thing mostly like, it, like find out. Find out what, what does that do like if you don't use a straw? I mean, yeah, that's a good thing, but there are better things. And think, yeah, really the science part, like learn the science yeah. and then start talking about the science because it's really big concepts, but they're not that complicated. No, nope, not that um, gigantic. And I think a big problem that we're in is that people don't know the science. Yeah, and and, or don't trust the science. And we can absolutely trust our scientists. I mean, it's just perfectly obvious, too, that plastic bags, single use stuff is not a great idea. And once you know the amount of plastic that's being thrown into our earth, it's just, you're horrified. Yeah, and then you can be the expert on these things. Yeah, I mean, like when I was yeah. reading the age of our readers for this, I knew everything about dinosaurs. Yeah. I grew up in DC and I'd go to Smithsonian kind of every rainy Saturday and I love that. But you guys can be experts on climate science. Yeah, and we're more putting productive. more stuff on our website too, astronauts.space. Yes. Wait. Oh. Let me go into the. Uh, this is our high tech. The foyer. Hmm. And if you go to astronauts.space, you can both learn how to do artwork like Stephen did. Yeah. And see some examples. And also go other places to just um, find out more about climate change. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you. So we. Yeah, and we, I mean, that's really who we want, why we wanted to give these books to kids because they're going to be the ones who are going to have to figure this out. Yeah. It's bad now in 10 years. Like no, it's going it to be is. much worse. We have made we a don't do di something. difficult bed. Sorry to hand that to you kids, but yeah. <laughs> help us. Yeah, well, we have a, a very informed generation growing up if they read your books, yeah. right? 
Yeah. Well, I didn't so, know perform. That's so cool. Yeah, the kids we've seen in schools are just like so smart about what's going on. Yeah. That's awesome to see. So we are almost at the end. If you could answer this question quickly from Catherine, pre or post COVID, do you come to schools for author talks? Um, and she says, I'd love for my students to hear about your creative process. Um, yeah, we definitely do school visits. Yeah, um, we've done, we did a bunch of touring for the first book. Yeah, and kind of based on festivals, book festivals, um, around the country. The Texas Book Festival is one of our favorites. And then through bookstores now, we're doing yeah. a bunch of Zoom visits. So yeah, if you want us to come to your school, find your local bookstore. Yeah, that's probably the best them. That's probably the best way. Because a lot of stores like Politics and Prose in yep. DC. It's another good um, one. We lo I, I love that store. Or Mitch Kaplan down in Miami. Books and Books is a spectacular store. And I've been to a lot of schools with him. Yeah. What was the other Great. question? No, that was all. Just how to get there. Yeah, that's most of them. Yeah. Yeah, that's the last question. And unfortunately, so sorry, but we're out of time for today. Thank you to John and Stephen for sharing your time with us so generously today. Thank yeah. you so much. Um, beaming in from space is brilliant. Um, we'll clean off our gravity machine yeah. too whenever you say <laughs> the word. Right. You say the word. Um, so we've been speaking with John Cheska and Steven Weinberg, whose latest book is Astronauts Mission to the Water Planet. You can find their presentation uh -oh. on the children's stage. Um, uh -oh. Uh -oh. Back. We're floating. John. <laughs> I'm upside down now. <laughs> Good luck, everyone. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for tuning in today. I hope you all take the time to explore our many programs and enjoy the remainder of the National Book Festival.